Verse four, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. The son of God is superior to the angels, meaning Jesus has an infinitely higher position by virtue of what he had accomplished in his redemptive work. And you can read about that in Philippians chapter two, verses nine through 11. Verse five reads, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Quoting from Psalms 2, 7 and 2 Samuel 7, 14, the writer presents the unique relationship that the son has with the father. The fact is no angel ever experienced such a relationship. The son shares the same fundamental nature of deity with the father from eternity past. The word today in this verse indicates that God's son was born in a point of time. He was always God, but he demonstrated his role as son in living form and was affirmed as such by his resurrection. Uh, Romans chapter one, verse four reads this way. He was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's look again at verse six. He again brings the firstborn. That refers to the prominence of the position, not the order of time. Christ was not the first to be born on earth but he holds the highest position of sovereignty. We read in Psalms 89, 27, as firstborn, in this sense, Christ can be called the firstborn over all creation, in that he is given the preeminence over all created beings. He is set apart to the service of God, and because he is preeminent, he is entitled to the inheritance as son. Now, five of the seven Old Testament passages quoted in this first chapter of Hebrews are in context related with the Davidic covenant. This covenant, which emphasizes the model of sonship, kingship, and kingdom. Verse seven, the writer continues biblical proofs that the angels are submissive to the Son of God by citing Psalms 104.4. 104.4 of Psalms is, the, is only one of seven Old Testament quotations in chapter one, which has no connection at all to the Davidic covenant. The quote simply defines the primary nature and purpose of angels. In verses eight and nine, quoting from Psalms 45, 6, and 7. The writer makes his case for the lordship of the son over creation, which was mentioned in verse 3. Let me read Psalms 45, verses 6 and 7 to you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of right uprighteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. This text is all the more significant since the statement of the son's deity is presented as the words of the father himself. It is clear that the writer of Hebrews has three messianic offices in mind. Verse one, prophet. Verse three, priests, and verse three and eight, king. And the initiation of those three offices require verse nine, an anointing. The title Messiah means the anointed one. Verses 10 and 12 
quoted from Psalms 102, 25 and 27. Let me read those to you as well. In the beginning, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will be discarded. But you remain the same and your years will never end. Make no mistake here in verses 10 through 12. It apply, they apply this passage to the Lord Jesus Christ. The, this passage clearly affirms the eternality and deity of Christ. The unchangeable God will outlast his creation, even into the new creation. I'll read 13 and 14 for you. To which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Verse 14, therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. The writer here reemphasizes the lordship of the son by quoting Psalms 110.1. This quotation from the Old Testament to strengthen the case that as son and Lord, the Messiah is superior to angels. This quote from Psalms 110.1 is repeated in the New Testament five different in five different books. It, it, it communicates, excuse me, it communicates the sovereignty of Christ overall. Philippians 2 and 10 puts it this way. At the time, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. While Christ, while Christ's purpose is to rule, the angels' destiny is to serve the receivers of salvation. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 3, Paul tells the Corinthians, do you not know that we will judge the angels? 